Hello, hello. Welcome to this session of the conference, which I am honored and excited to present to you, Halting the Myths in Their Tracks, Dispelling Cancer Nutrition Myths with Scientific Evidence. My name is Allison Tierney. I am a board certified oncology dietitian, and I have a pretty intense background in cancer from a professional, but also a personal experience, which I will be happy to share with you here today. So I am so honored to be joining you for this session. However, as you can imagine, and probably already tell, I'm not showing up live to this presentation as much as I wish I could join you live. However, unfortunately, my grandmother is an inpatient hospice right now, and I'm doing everything in my power to be able to spend the most amount of time with her in these last days because if there's anything that cancer has taught me in this life, it is truly what is most important and what is a priority in this life. And for me, that is family and that is being by my grandmother's side as much as humanly possible, but also the commitment to this session and helping to really spread the nutrition information when it comes to cancer. This is an incredible passion of mine. It's not only just a passion, it's my profession, but it's also quite personal. So I'm so happy that you are joining today and let's go ahead and get started. So today we're really gonna focus on the nutrition myths within the cancer community with an evidence-based lens. And the reason why I bring many of these topics up is because these are the conversations and the topics that a lot of patients are coming to me with that I'm constantly trying to dispel this information and really share the information that we know from scientific evidence about how we can contribute nutrition to this field. And in my opinion, nutrition is so underutilized when it comes to cancer, whether it comes to reducing our risk of developing cancer in the first place, helping during the course of treatment, and also especially into survivorship. There are oncology dietitians in cancer centers, not enough, and there's not enough information that is being delved out to patients, especially when they want it. A lot of individuals are coming to me outside of their cancer center because their oncology dietitian may not have given them the depth of knowledge that they were looking for. And that is really where I work with a lot of the clients. They want to go deeper, they want to go further. And what I like to say, they want to leave no stone unturned, right? They want to put everything they have at fighting this disease. And that is where some of my passion lies when it comes to nutrition. So today we're going to examine the myths of sugar feeds cancer and that all sugar should be avoided at all costs. We're also going to focus on soy. Um, soy then the myth that soy contains estrogen and that it should be avoided to reduce cancer risk, especially for estrogen receptor positive breast cancer survivors. Another myth is that cancer cells cannot survive in an alkaline environment. Therefore, consuming an alkaline diet is best for anyone with cancer. And then also the myth that uh, cancer survivors should do everything possible to consume only organic foods as part of a cancer fighting diet. Now, I'm interested to have some of the reactions and thoughts that you are having as I read these myths to you, but I promise we're going to get into it. I'm going to share the evidence and the information and my biggest Thing when it comes to presenting the information is I believe it's my job to present the information, share what research currently knows. Research is always changing. It's always evolving. And we're going to get to have more and more research as time goes on. But what can we glean from the information here? And the other most important part that I think a lot of people forget is what is realistic? What is something that we can actually do? And what do patients have access to? And I think that part is forgotten and we'll get to that. And then my other goal is to help make sure that we can explain these common nutrition myths in a way that's easily understood, whether somebody is in the medical community as a medical health professional or somebody that is not. And how do we understand these so that we can apply these to our current day and move forward from there? All right, so just a bit about me. As I mentioned, I'm a registered dietitian. I became a registered dietitian in 2014 and received my master's degree in nutrition and fitness shortly after that. Um, and I did it really quickly. And I actually did some of my master's degree in classes while I was doing my undergrad to be a registered dietitian. I had special dispensation from the university to be able to do that, um, which is why it looks like I completed that undergrad or that graduate degree in one year, um, but it did take a little bit longer than that. It just happened to be that's when I finished the coursework up and my, um, my thesis statement. I also became a board certified dietitian in oncology nutrition in 2016. If you are not familiar with this special board certification in oncology nutrition, there are some 
some select things as a registered dietitian that individuals can become a specialist in. And that requires every specialty has different requirements, but to become an oncology dietitian, With this board certification, you need to have, um, I believe it's 2,000 practice hours in oncology before you can sit for a board's exam. And that board's exam needs to be repeated every five years in order to stay credentialed. So which is why you can see that I was first initially certified in 2016 and again in 2021. And I have full plans on continuing this credentialing and taking these board certifications. Um, I've also been a graduate professor and adjunct graduate professor in evidence-based practice in oncology nutrition. And this is something that has been a really great pleasure of mine to do because it is a lot of young up and coming dietitians and I want to be able to positively influence them and how they look at oncology nutrition, the importance of oncology nutrition, and also making sure that we have a really good understanding about what the science and the data says so that we're giving our patients incredible quality information and ways to help them tackle that in their current situation. Now that's more of my professional and educational background, but I also have a very personal experience with cancer as well. Now, one of the reasons why I became an oncology dietitian is truly because of the cancer that has burned in my family for generations. And I actually have a previous degree in business and leadership and went back to school to be a dietitian. And I wanted to be a dietitian because of all the people that you see here on the screen. And I wanted to know how could nutrition help reduce the risk of developing cancer in the first place? How could it help during the course of treatment to make sure that we're tolerating treatment or treatment's more effective, improving quality of life, reducing short-term side effects and long-term side effects of treatment? How can nutrition help? And also into survivorship, what can we do to help reduce our risk of recurrence through diet and also lifestyle. And as you can imagine, I don't think I'd be presenting here in front of you today if we didn't know and find that yes, nutrition can play a crucial role in all three parts of this, whether it be risk reduction during the course of treatment and into survivorship. So here, um, top of the left screen is my grandfather who unfortunately passed away from liver cancer. This is my grandmother, who is the one that is unfortunately in in inpatient hospice. She's actually a breast and uterine cancer survivor. This is a picture of my maternal grandmother, who passed away before I was born and unfortunately passed away from lung cancer. This is my mom. My mom is a two-time breast cancer survivor and thyroid cancer survivor. And my godmother, who's my mom's cousin, is also a breast cancer survivor. And if you picked up on it here as well, I myself am also a cancer survivor and experienced breast cancer diagnosis at the age of 33. So to share a little bit about my story is the fact that I was an oncology dietitian before I was diagnosed with cancer. But I also think that my career as an oncology dietitian, the people that came before me in diagnosis, especially young cancer survivors, were really part of helping to identify my breast cancer diagnosis quite early on so that, I mean, we caught it early, um, have incredibly prognosis, and I'm so thankful for that. But where my breast cancer journey started really truly was here. This is a picture of me nursing my daughter, my second daughter, my youngest daughter, in her last nursing session. And It might seem silly for some people to have a photo of your last nursing session. However, I did this both times for both my kids. And the reason for it is because breastfeeding was a very important part of my motherhood journey. It was also, as you can imagine, as a dietitian, very important to me from a nourishing aspect of being able to nourish my children. And my husband and I unfortunately encountered infertility both times when we were trying to get pregnant with our kids. Spoiler alert, we have two beautiful, healthy daughters um, that we couldn't be more grateful for. However, in this photo here, I can tell you exactly what I was thinking. I was fearful that infertility was going to take this opportunity away from me again. The opportunity to be able to breastfeed another child. And at that moment, I can tell you that I never would have thought that it was going to be cancer that was going to take that opportunity away from me, not infertility. And so about 10 days after this uh, photo right here, I had an annual exam with my OBGYN, uh, breast exam. We found a lump. 
didn't really do anything about it. Be, and that is because I just finished breastfeeding and breasts change a lot during breastfeeding. It could be a milk clogged duct, etc. So we didn't really do much about it. But I went home and I always paid attention to it. I kept feeling it. And the only thing that I can truly describe is that every time I touched it, I felt anxious. And I finally reached out to my doctor again a few weeks later and said, I would like to have this further checked out because I'm concerned and I think I need some peace of mind. Um, Immediately, we got an ultrasound. Ultrasound was concerning, had a mammogram. Mammogram was concerning and ended up having a biopsy, which 48 hours later confirmed breast cancer diagnosis at the age of 33. Breast cancer and all cancer types are really raising in young adults, and um, there's a lot of work to be done, and hopefully this can be part of it, and my story can be helpful for early detection, but also reducing our risk of developing the disease in the first place. So after this diagnosis, I opted to have a double mastectomy with something called D-flap reconstruction. D-flap reconstruction is when you utilize your own tissue to recreate the breast. So I do not have implants, but I do have reconstruction. And leading into this surgery, I chose to have a double mastectomy um, because I also found out that I have a genetic mutation. And as you can imagine, The family history makes a little bit more sense when it, when you find out that you have a genetic mutation, you've been diagnosed at a really young age, um, and uh, at the same time, you know, a lot of people in your family have been burdened with cancer. But as we know, and I'll continue to share throughout this, you know, genetics isn't the only piece to this. Cancer is multifactorial in its development and its progression. Um, having a genetic mutation does raise the risk of developing cancer, but it doesn't necessarily mean somebody is going to develop cancer over their lifetime. So I did opt to have this double mastectomy. And unfortunately, in the surgical pathology, we actually identified that my diagnosis had changed from DCIS with microinvasion, meaning that it had um, believed to be contained in the mammary gland and then moved out of the mammary gland just a little bit um, to finding out that it was actually invasive ductal carcinoma. And the invasive ductal carcinoma piece was what's called triple positive. And that means that the cancer was positive for estrogen receptors, positive for estrogen receptors, positive for progesterone receptors, and also positive for something called HER2. And so the standard of care here is um, to have uh, chemotherapy and immunotherapy. So I I chose to undergo immunotherapy and chemotherapy. And there's a lot of questions looming now, I think, about about chemotherapy and whether people should undergo it. Does it kill more people than it actually kills the cancer? Um, there's, there's a lot out there. And I can tell you my personal opinion, my personal experience is that I wanted to do everything that I possibly could to help reduce the risk of cancer ever coming back. And that was for my kids. That was for my husband. Um, that's who I, I did this for me, but I also did that for them. But also, as you can imagine, that wasn't the only tool that I used to help me overcome this. And um, as you'll see, as we continue nutrition, lifestyle medicine, so many different pillars of approach, I think that are incredibly important to help us reduce our risk of developing cancer in the first place, but also help when there is a diagnosis and into survivorship. So I had three months of chemotherapy and immunotherapy, the nine months of immunotherapy. And if you can tell in this photo, I actually have a gray cap on. This is actually a cold cap that I wore during chemotherapy to help save my hair. I had very good success with my chemotherapy cold capping. Um, As you can see, I have a full head of hair. This is all real hair. Um, I estimate that I saved about 85% of my hair during cold capping. However, cold capping is not available to everybody. It isn't an option for everybody. It is financially um, difficult. And the whole process itself is really hard and sometimes not even successful. So that's something to know about cold capping. But I am thankful that I had access to it and the opportunity to try it and had good success. Now, I continued on and had nine more months of immunotherapy for a total of uh, one year of infusions. And I'm grateful to be able to say that I completed my treatment on August 3rd, 2023. And I got through it 
really incredibly well. And it's not to say that there wasn't hardships and there weren't hard days and it just, <laughs> it sucked, right? Um, however, I was told multiple times over and over that I had gone through chemotherapy better than anybody had seen before. And I think this is a testament to my diet, my lifestyle, and all those pillars of health. And that is why I'm so incredibly passionate about being able to bring my knowledge, my expertise, my personal experience to the cancer community. And one thing that I think it's really important to touch on, which will lead into starting to talk about these myths, is because there is so much fear when it comes to a cancer diagnosis. And that fear comes from so many different angles. You know, from my profession and my personal experience, one of those is nutrition. And there is so much information out in the world on the internet about nutrition and cancer. And a lot of it is fear inducing. And I will not say that I didn't have fear around food ever when it came to my cancer diagnosis. However, what I really want is for nutrition to be empowering. There's so much out of our control when it comes to cancer, but there there are some things that are in our control and nutrition is one of them. And my goal is to help empower cancer patients with knowledge that helps empower them in making choices when it comes to their nutrition, that empowers them, that makes them stronger, that not only impacts their physical health, but their mental, emotional, and their spiritual. Nutrition goes beyond just the actual food in our tummies or the vitamins and minerals and phytonutrients it can go so much deeper and be so much more empowering than many people believe it can be. So it's so even though I'm going to present the research here today and the information, what I think is commonly missed is the empowerment piece of nutrition. And it's not talked about enough. We need to continue to work nutrition into being a standard part of treatment and protocol when somebody is diagnosed with cancer. And um, yeah, that is the biggest thing that I'm here to educate on today. So what do you say we go ahead and get started? Um, what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to take the video off of myself so that we can concentrate on the science and then we'll go ahead and get started on that and I'll come back on the video after this.